A massive addition to the Pac-12 conference was announced yesterday as Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington will be joining the Pac-12 with all of their sports in July of 2026. As you already know, Gonzaga University is an absolute powerhouse in basketball. Year in and year out, both the men's and women's basketball teams are consistently in the NCAA tournament. Gonzaga over the last five seasons has an 86.7% winning percentage. Combined with both men's and women's basketball, the women's program has an 85.7% winning percentage, and the men's program is a national best 148 in 21, an 87.6% winning percentage over those last five years. The Gonzaga men's basketball team is the only program in the country to appear in each of the last nine Sweet 16s, matching the longest streak since the AA tournament expanded in 1985, as well as five Elite Eight appearances over the last nine NCAA tournaments. Gonzaga's head coach, Mark Few, currently has the best winning percentage among active head coaches at an 83.4% winning percentage, which is also the best in NCAA Division I all time with a minimum of 10 seasons. At the end of the day, all of this realignment with collegiate athletics comes down to money. The Pac-12 universities have gone to other conferences because they think that they can make more money in other places. And with pretty much every university, the leading sport is football. However, with this addition of Gonzaga to the Pac-12, they now have eight universities in all sports aside from football. They will have to add at least one more university with a football team. But instead of football being the main focus, now with this addition and others to come, this is a basketball conference. And by having more quality basketball teams that are consistently making the NCAA tournament, that means more overall revenue for the conference and each university. So let's get into this episode with Dylan Howe talking the addition of Gonzaga to the Pac-12. We also have on lead sports anchor for NBC San Diego, Darnay Tripp. Darnay used to cover Spokane and Gonzaga sports. He is now in San Diego and he covers San Diego State University among other teams. And he could speak to Gonzaga, San Diego State and the power of the Pac-12 basketball conference. But before we do, the sponsor of this podcast is Black Label Supplements, Grind, Hustle, Win, Repeat. Use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And more breaking news in the Pac-12 realignment as yesterday it was announced that Gonzaga will be joining the Pac-12 with all of their sports. Of course, they don't currently have a football team. So now Pac-12 has seven football universities and they have eight for the other sports, I believe. Dylan, is that correct? Yeah, so obviously seven FBS football teams. You need eight to make a FBS division. We have until 2026, the Pac-12, to get that eighth member. And then Gonzaga, the bell of the ball. Literally one of the biggest college basketball brands you could get out there. And the Pac-12 went full circle on them. And getting Gonzaga now might reopen some things with a few of the AAC schools in terms of Memphis, Tulane, UTSA. It, it, it was a huge deal adding Gonzaga. You have them now with San Diego State, uh, two schools that have been in the national championship over the last four years. The additions of Colorado State, Utah State give you two solid programs that have made the NCAA tournament. Um, Nico Medved, great head coach at Colorado State. You know, we've seen Utah State kind of be a jumping board. Danny Sprinkle, the one year wonder there, took him to the uh, to the tournament. And then he obviously takes the UW job after the turnaround he did there. So there's great foundation pieces. This is a basketball conference right now that you have to put anywhere four through six. And according to last year's net ratings, uh, we just be would, would be subtly ahead of the ACC and behind the Big Ten, the Big 12, and uh, the SEC. And so Gonzaga makes the jump from the WCC to the Pac-12 and we'll we'll see if they add any, any other universities. But Gonzaga, like we've talked about, is a powerhouse. They're in the tournament every year. And the big deal about this is that they bring in bring in a ton of potential revenue to the conference that they were really looking for. Do you know kind of how much that might be? You know, there's been like prognosticators that have said, you know, Gonzaga is anywhere from 10 to $15 million per year in terms of media revenue. And, and that's kind of where the Pac-12 is, is kind of, near in terms of getting a media revenue share anywhere from nine to $15 million. So I think getting Gonzaga is going to reopen things with a school like Memphis. Um, Cause when you take a look at the AAC right now, Cincinnati, Houston, gone. Memphis doesn't have anyone that's in the top 80, according to Bart Torvik, um, who's very similar to Ken Palm in, 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 
rating teams going into the season. So right away, if Memphis joins the Pac-12, you now have a home and home with Gonzaga, who is perennially top 15, top 20 in net. San Diego State. So there's four matchups right away that are huge for, for March Madness. So now you look at the AAC now. I mean, it's the, the best brands basketball-wise that are remaining in that conference are, are Memphis. And then you have Temple, who's hasn't been the best brand over the last five to ten years. I mean, they were a big giant, obviously, in the 90s and the 80s um, under Coach Chaney. So, um, you know, it's interesting – uh, to see how all of this is playing out. According to John Canzano, the conference's Ken Palm score would now rank fifth nationally, uh, slipping in front of the ACC, like we said. You know, it's it's interesting to see, you know, Mark Few and, and the Gonzaga brass finally making that jump. We've heard of, you know, possibilities over the years of them almost getting to the Mountain West Conference. There was talks to the Big East and the Big 12, and geographically it didn't fit. So when the statement came out yesterday of the addition of, of Gonzaga, one of the big things you read in that Pac-12 statement was that all presidents and all universities wanted to keep their student athletes in mind in terms of where you're not having the Stanford and Cal aspect of their Olympic sports, Stanford swimming, Cal track, going out to the ACC, going east. So uh, the presidents and the universities really came together and they want to make sure that this is going to be a regionality conference, but also they're showing like, hey, we care about basketball going forward because in terms of where the amount of money for football expenditures on a year as well as basketball expenditures on a year are very similar with these schools. And with that being said, we're going to have on Darnay Tripp, who is the lead sports anchor for NBC San Diego to talk about the implications of Gonzaga joining the Pac-12, the, the basketball conference that the Pac-12 is becoming with San Diego State and these other universities joining. So let's bring on Darnay. All right, Darnay, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Initial reactions to Gonzaga being announced yesterday that they're join joining the Pac-12. I think it's great. I mean, I think, you know, for somebody like myself who's been around that program, I think this was a hope of mine that, that this would... Uh, that this would happen eventually. And it just makes perfect sense. You know, Gonzaga has stuck around the WCC maybe longer than people expected them to. There was some flirtation with the Mountain West. When I was in Spokane, it was probably around like 2016, 2017. It allowed Gonzaga to kind of maybe strong arm the WCC a little bit and get a bit more out of them. But once they lose BYU, that was obviously a really important rivalry. And, and you know, they strengthened kind of the the overall conference. Um, I think it, it made sense for them to kind of move on at some point. Obviously, everything that happened with the Pac-12, you know, through that influx as it did with a lot of programs, including San Diego State. Uh, but once that they kind of linked up with Oregon State, Washington State, trimmed some of the fat, I think, in the Mountain West, you had to think that this was a potential move. And I'm kind of curious now, does the St. Mary's come along with them? Now that they're in, does Memphis kind of rethink their decision? So I think it's it's a big step, and you know you you're laying the foundation for what could be a really exciting college basketball conference. Um, obviously, hey, you had your time in Spokane. You're now down here in San Diego, so you you were along the run in the national championship with San Diego State a couple years ago. Um, the Pac-12, their ability to really kind of key in on college basketball. You have two schools now that have been in a national championship over the last four years. I mean, how uh, big uh, is it to have these two programs kind of spearheading this conference from a basketball standpoint going forward? I think it's great. And it's a little bit refreshing to have decisions made for college basketball because college basketball has just kind of been at the mercy of everything that's happened from a football standpoint, as have pretty much all the other sports. And so to make a move like this to kind of plant their flag as a strong basketball conference and see if others join as a result of that, I think is cool. I think it's refreshing. I think it's really exciting. And you know, people are posting kind of like average Ken Palm rankings, that sort of thing from from the last five years. Like it's impressive, like the number of teams that are consistently in the top 75 and, you know, the the programs like an Oregon State, like if it's Oregon State, that's kind of dragging you down from like an average Ken Palm ranking standpoint. Well, at least this has been like a power conference. They've had some good years under Wayne Tinkle. So I think it's great. I think just the fact that 
you're going to be able to develop some of these rivalries. Like when I was in Spokane, when the Zags played WSU was a big deal. And like, it didn't happen every year, but those were lean years, the Ernie Kenton years. But when Gonzaga was in Pullman, like the place was packed. And as you know, 10,000 in Beasley. Yeah. The place was not yeah, always it, packed outside of that. <laughs> you know, maybe yeah, when I mean, you're having, came to town, that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, you're average anywhere from 2,500 to 3,200 people, obviously Kyle Smith gone into Stanford, but there's a lot of momentum still. And we saw right initially, uh, when Gonzaga was announced, $3 million donation from the Dutch Bros CEO, a 1.5 to Oregon State women's basketball, 1.5 to uh, Oregon State men's basketball. And and unfortunately, WSU just doesn't have those big uh, alums that are going to give you a lump sum. It's more so of, of an army of Cougs trying to, trying to help that out. But um, one thing that I did read uh, from San Diego State AD John David Wicker, uh, what gets lost on people is that Alabama or Ohio State or even in Iowa State, football revenue is so large that it dwarfs basketball revenue. But at our level, basketball rev revenue is so much closer to football revenue. So basketball is that much more meaningful to our institutions. And obviously you have football drawing all the lines in terms of TV uh, and, and, and media shares. But I think with the pack, is doing is hey let's go all in on basketball because hey football's only around six months out of the year and we might as well have a conference that's going to be able to gain traction and, and national attention um and you take a look at gonzaga's schedule they've got kentucky ucla they're playing in the bahamas uh battle for atlantic so you have eight to ten marquee non-conference games on their schedule every season it's great. And you mentioned kind of the NIL from the NIL perspective and, you know, San Diego state, like they're, they're putting a lot of effort into it. I feel like, you know, probably similar to Gonzaga, what I've heard from friends that, you know, our Gonzaga alums, just kind of the concern, like, can we keep up? Can we hang with these programs? Uh, and, and to the credit of, of Brian Dutcher, kind of an old school coach has been around for a while, like probably not in his comfort zone to be asking people for money in this manner. Like they're really doing it because they know how important it is. And, and so they're willing to adapt, which I think is, is to their credit. Uh, there's also a lot fewer mouths to feed with basketball, right? Like you might not be able to get as much money as a football program, but you've got fewer guys that are going to demand that type of money just because of roster size. And maybe you're really focused on like a, a handful of guys, whether they're your starters or star players. And so I think that's where these programs are, are able to compete. And, you know, of late San Diego state's been more of a basketball school than a football school. I think there's a lot of excitement around Sean Lewis about him kind of modernizing the program and getting them to a place where they're a bit more competitive and, and they're getting back in the top 25, like we've seen in the past. Uh, but, what Brian Dutcher has done with his program and going back to Steve Fisher, uh, but especially these last few years, it's been really impressive. Obviously a national tournament run. They're a tournament team every single year. They're drawing impact type transfers and you know, the community is really engaged with what they're doing. And, and you see that in the environment at Viejas Arena. And I think that's only going to grow now when you are guaranteed to see Gonzaga home or away, maybe it's a home and home, but at least once a year or every other year at VA Haas Arena and some of these other programs, Washington State, Oregon State, uh, maintaining some of those Mountain West rivalries. But look, nobody's going to be upset that San Jose State's not coming to VA Haas Arena, that Air Force isn't coming to VA Haas Arena just from a competitive standpoint. So uh, I think it's good what they're doing, kind of trimming some of the fat and investing in basketball in a meaningful way. And the other thing with basketball is like, you see their faces, right? Basketball players are inherently marketable. They can dunk on guys and then you can get a tight shot of the athlete. You know what I mean? Like these yeah. are meaningful. And obviously people know who the quarterback at Alabama is, who the star wide receiver at Ohio State is. They might not necessarily know who the offensive lineman is, but they'll probably recognize the power forward at San Diego State. They'll probably recognize the shooting guard at West Virginia, that sort of thing, because you see them all the time. They're on camera. There's only a handful of these guys. And so I think, you know, it's another way in which basketball you know, is is especially marketable in some um, respects, maybe more so than a, a game like football. And, you know, one last basketball question, because I know we do want to ask you one question about just the environment and Padres in Petco last <laughs> night. Um, very jealous. 
uh, could hear it from North Park. <laughs> um, out of these, you know, Wilner and a few other scribes have, have said, hey, there's there's two or three schools as other non-football, you know, St. Mary's Grand Canyon and, you know, maybe a, a, a USF. Who do you think would be the best fit if you could only take one of those schools for basketball only? I mean, I, w- I, I still have the Memphis dream. And I think if you go back to what the AD said a week or so ago, he certainly wasn't slamming the door on the Pac-12, you know? It, yeah, it sounded to... like, call us back with a better yeah. offer. And I do wonder now that Gonzaga is locked in and potentially St. Mary's. Do they see that and say, okay, there's there's legitimacy here, certainly from a basketball standpoint. What I'm really curious about is the reports out uh, on Wednesday that they are shopping their media rights deal and expect to have that locked in before they add in add any other programs. Obviously, the people involved in those discussions are far smarter than me. Um, I would just want to make sure they're able to maximize what they get to make to, to ensure that they are are, um, are are attractive and can make a significant offer to the Memphises, Tulane's, USF, whoever that may be. I don't know if there's like escalator clauses, like this is what it yeah. would be with these schools. This is what it would be if you added a, a Memphis and, and whoever else. You got to imagine that that's the case. But uh, I found that interesting today and um i do still find myself hoping for a program like memphis because they still seem like the best one that's still available in a conference that you would think they've kind of significantly outgrown and you would imagine that they would be uh you know you'd think interested in joining a now a strong basketball conference uh with enough quality football programs that you have a clear path to uh to the playoff as it expands yeah, and I think it's very similar you know, when we go back to Big 12, when they added the four corner schools, ESPN had that pro rata, regardless, hey, you get added, $30 million. Um, it, It's very similar. And the other thing about the AAC, it's very similar to Pac-12. If one of those programs leaves, whether it's Tulane or, or Memphis, you have to figure the, the other top brands are gone as well. Yeah. So uh, it's going to be an interesting next couple weeks, months to see how that plays out. Um, Connor, uh, you know, question in terms of how Petco was. Yeah, I mean, the Padres get a huge win last night in game one of the wild card against the Braves, four to zero. Michael King's out there on the mound, 12 strikeouts. Just walk me through the emotion that's going throughout that city and that park right now and the excitement being in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the city's on fire, you know, as as Dylan certainly knows being around. Um, and it was like that all regular season as well. You know, uh, they set an attendance record, a, a full season attendance record. And we saw it in 2022, just the electric atmosphere that you have here. And it was it was there last night. Certainly the Tatis homer in the first inning, starting the way that it did. And the towels are out. You know, it was cool seeing it under the lights when Robert Suarez comes in the ninth inning and then, you know, down to the last final outs. Uh, it was it was awesome. It's just what you would expect. And, you know, San Diego is a baseball town and it's a great baseball city. Uh, they've invested in this team. They've got star players that have people fired up. Even last year when they weren't playing well, people continue to show up and, and they've been rewarded. The fans have uh, for their dedication. So it's been really, really cool to see and um, excited what. Wednesday brings maybe Thursday. Hopefully we don't, we don't need a Thursday and uh, it's a trip up to LA this weekend and the Dodgers eventually coming down here as well. Uh, but it's electric. It's incredible atmosphere. They tell the players are blown away by it and fueled by it and uh, excited to see it again tonight. It's going to be exciting rest of the series. And yeah, that next series as well. Appreciate your time. I know you have a press conference to get, to get to again, <laughs> Darnay. Thank you for your time. Thanks Darnay. Thanks, Great to talk to you again. Appreciate you too.